That's a dumbass question. No offense. I don't honestly I'm giving up on becoming a rock star. I'm just doing this for fun. Uh, look, excuse me. It could be worse, you know. You know, that's rarely ever an incorrect statement, at least in an existential sense. Wow. My own co-host calling me pretentious. I guess it's just gonna be one of those weeks, huh? Alright, so a couple weeks ago we did a uh, Leviathan. Might as well move a little bit further back into uh, the dark mists of the past of black metal in the United States and cover Judas Iscariot. Hey, you fucking half of hate. Oh god, it's Joey from New Jersey. What the hell do you want? Listen, you fucking cocksucker. You've been slagging off the band Creed for the past three episodes. I'll have you know, that is some of the greatest black metal to come out of the state of New Jersey. Get the fuck out of here, you greasy bastard. It's not even as good as fucking Abzagarath. And nobody knows who the hell Abzagarath is. Nobody even knows how to pronounce that. You haven't covered a quality New Jersey metal band on this very Light in the Loafers program since Discordance Axis, like two or three years ago, dude. I don't know, I'll do like a fucking Ripper and Corpse episode or Dim Mock or something. Leave me alone. Get the hell out of my office. Hey, you use my own catchphrases against me. I die. 네 여러분 안녕하세요. 오늘은 바로 바로 저. Nah, you wouldn't know him. He's from the uh, the before time. But anyways, Judas Iscariot. You might have heard of them. They've been covered by shitloads of bands like Leviathan, I Shall Become, Zaster. They're sort of, well, they. It's just he. It's just one guy. It's Akhenaten. What is Akhenaten? Akhenaten is this dude's pseudonym. His real name is Andrew J. Harris. His dad was like a barrister or like in some Illinois Supreme Court or he was like running for senator or something. So in 2002 or like 2003, his dad paid to like move him to Germany because he was uh, making very illiberal statements to the media and it was kind of jeopardizing his political career. So we haven't heard anything much from Mr. Akhenaten as of late. Akhenaten also was a really wacky ancient Egyptian pharaoh, something of a, a religious reformer slash crazy person. The black metal take on him is kind of one of two options. You got Countess from Netherlands saying that he's like the father of monotheism and thus, according to the uh, diktats of the twin black metal pillars of Satanism and paganism, he should be destroyed. Also, if you go down in a slightly more politically incorrect route, uh, you got like the Savitri Devi, uh, lightning in the sun type stuff, but that is a bit beyond the scope of me making wacky jokes about black metal. Suffice to say, Andrew A. Harris, a.k.a. Akhenaten, kind of combines both of those ideas into how he uh, presents himself ideologically. He's also influenced by a lot of like the German idealists like Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, going back to Kant, as well as English dudes like William Blake, Marriage of Heaven and Hell. That's a big influence on Akhenaten's work. That particular piece of art has also been interpreted by uh, European bands like Ulva, in a black metal context in the past, and he's influenced by the uh, transcendentalists, such as Ralph Waldo Emerson and uh, Henry David Thoreau. So you kind of put all those together, add a little bit more Satan, a little bit more uh, slightly um, stuff that could get you in trouble where you describe the uh, full scope of the ideology, and you get the basic idea of what Judas Iscariot is about lyrically. However, that's not nearly as important as the music. So what's the deal with Judas Iscariot? Well, we're going back way into the early 90s here. We have this record label, Moribund. Perhaps you've heard of them. That was uh, Leviathan's old label. Had some legal troubles there. It's also Infestor's label. Did some shit with the, uh, the meat shits. Big U.S. institution, particularly for uh, early U.S. black metal signing stuff like Wind of the Black Mountains and whatnot. And for Judas Iscariot, who in many ways is sort of like the most coherent American answer to the uh, Scandinavian stuff of the early 90s, at least when it comes to talking about bands from the mid-90s and whatnot. A lot of the other U.S. black metal bands were either very much into blasphemy and mockery and didn't sound terribly Nordic at all, like Grand Belial's Key and uh, Pro Fanatica, or else they were sort of like semi-decent, often rather cringy, slavish imitations of early emperor you get with uh, Crimson Moon or Bloodstained Dusk. But Judas Iscariot and I Shall Become, 
at least in their very early stuff, are sort of competing for the title of the American Burzum. Very similar stuff to uh, Satanic War Master in terms of its fascination with black metal aesthetics. And in fact, I'm pretty sure Akhenaten and uh, Werewolf were friends. What that means is you get stuff like this. I swear every black metal band worth their salt has to be one super short, ultra primitive track in the style of Vaughn, who of course influenced Burzum. I mean, that was Judas Iscariot. Now you're hearing Marduk doing the same thing on their album that came out the same year with Judas Iscariot's debut. That's just kind of a thing that bands like to do, I guess. And if you're going to have, like, one super fast, super primitive song, then you got to have one super long, super minimalist, doomy song. This is the final song on the first album. It's called Nietzsche, and it's very much in the style of... Uh, Quintessence from Dark Throne and other doomier black metal tracks with him reciting German philosophy over it. Pretty standard stuff. For comparison, here's Dark Throne's Quintessence. You have some very uh, epic, semi philosophical lyrics. You have a riff that only has a couple notes in it. They repeat it or do variations on it for like eight minutes. There you go. Now, if that's all there was to Judas Iscariot was sort of just utilizing these Nordic black metal tropes, maybe slightly modifying them, then a lot of the criticism thrown towards Akhenaten Way would be very justifiable. However, and luckily for us, that is not the case. Apart from the uh, little bells and whistles, a lot of this stuff is actually very original. Here there's an obvious Burzum influence with these uh, kind of slowly morphing, layered, minimalist riffs. But they're going to transition into some pretty uh, percussive, downright thrashy stuff in a bit once we get through a little bit more of this blasting. It's him doing every instrument, by the way, which is admirable. Perhaps misguided with the uh, blastier parts, but here the drumming fits perfectly with this very, very nasty riff that you could definitely see being an influence on some of the later thrashier parts of uh, Leviathan. This song's called Babylon, by the way. It's about uh, pretty much what you think it's about. Not very nice to uh, certain desert tribes, to say the least. But I enjoy that one quite a bit. The title track of this album, The Cold Earth Slept Below, features some very interesting kind of weird bendy riffs. Maybe somewhat comparable to uh, what the guys in France were doing at the same time, the Le Légion Noir guys. But then this particular sort of counterpoint riff here is pretty much wholly unique to Judas Iscariot. Utilizing very expansive chords where he's picking out each individual note and letting them ring out. Almost sounds kind of happy at times, certainly very meditative in keeping with uh, the lyrical content, pulling a lot from American transcendentalists. So there's that. That's the first album. And I honestly wasn't going to talk about it at all. But then when I was doing my research for this episode, I really listened to it for the first time in years, and it turns out it's actually pretty good, so go and get that. So that sort of, you know, puts his stamp on the scene, that first album. Then we get to kind of like the middle era of Judas Iscariot, which is interesting. This one's called The Heavens Drop of Human Gore. It's a great song. It's uh, one of the first ones I ever heard on account of um, I Shall Become covered it as bonus tracks on their first album. And you can hear that Burzum influence coming in very steadily. The drumming is better than the first album, but it's still not great. Very sloppy, but very heartfelt. Utilizing some kind of droning textures, very reminiscent of Burzum, as I already mentioned. Also possibly Dark Throne's Transylvanian Hunger album. I like his vocals here too, kind of nocturnal culto esque. But the transition coming up is super duper fucking sloppy. Watch this. That was <laughs> an interesting linking riff. This riff, however, is really, really good. And that's kind of the issue I have with a lot of the mid era Judas Iscariot albums. There's a lot of great riffs, they're not always well tied together. But this riff is in fact so good that it kind of makes up for that sloppy transition out of the Burzumi stuff into 
more uniquely Judas Iscariot style rocking riffs. Very, very interesting stuff. But towards the end of Judas Iscariot's tenure, he actually fixed that problem. I don't know if he was reading reviews or what, but he got much better at layering sounds and kind of stitching different ideas together. This is off the Heaven in Flames album, which is sort of a watershed for Judas Iscariot because he got another drummer. He got a real drummer this time, not just him playing the drums overdub and shit. It's Cryptic Winter who also was in Dying Fetus and, uh, ugh, Krieg. Yikes. But this song is pretty fucking cool. It's kind of like the highest evolution. That's sort of that weird, jangly, almost indie rock thing he'd been doing for a minute. And I gotta say it kicks ass. Having a real drummer in the band really elevates the material. But also, he got really, really good at, like, layering together these catchy riffs and kind of stitching them together in a way that made sense on this album. He also started utilizing keyboards, but not Emperor style keyboards, not even really Burzum style keyboards. He's got his own way of doing them. Here's an interesting interaction between a very jangly, almost nonsensical guitar line to the point where the lead melody is definitely coming out of the keyboards. This is a bit of a transition into a very epic section on the first track on the album. told you it was epic. See, this is good stuff. He's using that kind of weird burzum dissonant jangle that not many bands can seem to get right. In fact, most bands that riff off burzum don't even attempt these kind of riffs. They just play kind of the more conventional tremolo ones. Not so with Judas Iscariot. He's got his own thing to say with his six string, and he does it very well. And here is where the keyboards really shine. Very, very well done, epic, cathedral-esque sound. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the drumming is top-notch. So Heaven in Flames is sort of like, if you're going to get a Judas Iscariot album, that might be the one to get. Perhaps not the most historically important compared to uh, the first album or any, like, the first four. But I think he really nailed his sound with that album. The later stuff actually continues to improve. The production isn't quite as lo-fi, but it... You know, it's still raw enough to be considered black metal. And the keyboards are fantastic in terms of the great melodies that you can crank out of them. This one is called In the Valley of Death, I Am Their King. And it's off of the final Judas Iscariot full length. Very Bathory influenced, sort of ambient riffing style. Like Viking rowing chant type cadence. So of course I'm going to dig that. So definitely recommend that last album they put out. And this is the kind of crap that my trolls do to fuck with me because they're jealous of my dark powers. Also the Dethroned, Conquered and Forgotten EP reminds me quite a bit of uh, Satanic War Master. It's very fast, it's very melodic, and it's very catchy. It has a bit of an oi punk thing going on. And some really good drumming from uh, old Cryptic Winter there. I think his real name is like Dwayne something. Dwayne Timlin maybe. But if you're a black metal fan, worth your salt. You're definitely gonna, gonna want to pick up that Deep Throne Conquered and Forgotten EP. As well as the To Embrace the Corpses Bleeding album. That's the final Judas Iscariot full length. You know, get Heaven and Flames too. That one's obviously great. Just get all like the Judas Iscariot stuff. It's pretty good and people like the shit on the poor guy. Especially Europeans. They really hate this band. They see it as kind of like an American trend follower. But then again, like, entire European scene bought into all that like orthodox black metal crap that did like two good albums. Maybe if you're being generous. You know, you guys are kind of full of shit too. Plus Alcest? Come on. Whatever. I don't know. That's Judas Iscariot. Hope you liked it. See you around.